to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, you probably realise my presentation today will be divided into three sections, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and any similarity that, that that may have with the three speakers from Rothamsted today is purely coincidental. OK, the good. Uh, just to give you um, a, a schematic here of uh, a breakdown of the uh, sales of insecticides worldwide a few years ago, um, and we can see... This pointer isn't very good. Shall I use the club? Yes. Um, neonicotinoids uh, representing a very large proportion, and in fact that's, that's increased since 2010. Pyrethroids also very high. So, um, the pest I work on primarily is the peach potato aphid, Mises persky. It comes in a range of colours, a bit like Smarties. Unfortunately, there isn't a close association between colour and resistance. That would be very useful, um, but that doesn't hold, I'm afraid. So, what we've been doing as part of a collaborative project, uh, which is funded in part by HTCA, agrochemical companies and other uh, levy boards, and CRD, uh, the government funder, we've been taking live samples of peach potato aphids from crops, uh, field crops and protected crops, and we've been screening them with a range of insecticides to see how they respond, essentially challenging these aphids to these compounds to see what their response is. So to start off, we've been looking at the response to neonicotinoids, and we've been using imidacloprid as a representative of that. And we can have a breakdown of, uh, going back all the way to 2004, of the percentage of samples that have contained what we consider to be mobile forms. Those that are capable of walking after having a screening dose of 10 ppm. And you can see there's been ups and downs, but nothing dramatic. And 2013 hasn't seen a, a greater increase. So it's good news, actually, for the neonics uh, in, this, in this particular country, in the UK. And on, on top of this, the screening dose allows us to look for any higher levels of resistance. Mobile aphids don't reproduce. They just have what we might uh, consider to be uh, reduced sensitivity. They don't reproduce. And we've never seen in the UK samples aphids that have sat there producing nymphs, which would represent higher levels of resistance. Um, here we can see the range of resistance that now exists in this species. These are dose-response lines from the susceptible to R, what we call R, R, R+, plus, and then these very resistant ones that are, are, have appeared in southern Europe, and I'll talk about those later. And if you superimpose the samples going back to 2010 over these data, you can see they sit quite nicely higher up on the susceptible and the R types, which also which reflects the fact that they're not very resistant and neonics should work well against them when applied at rates aimed at aphids. Moving on, uh, we've been screening also with pymetrazine and the leaf dip bioassay. And again, we have a baseline which we've been comparing uh, samples going back, in this case, to uh, up to 2012, 2012 and 2013. And we have a screening dose of 30 ppm in this case. And you can see there was some variation in the past with a couple of samples sitting here, which sort of potentially might have raised concerns. However, when I took these aphids and I transferred them to fresh material that was untreated, they died. So I think this might be some sort of starvation effect. We might have a, a variation in the level of ability to withstand starvation because we think this compound causes the aphids to starve. And so it's not true resistance, it's just um, uh, something else. So 2012, they sit better on the baseline and 2013 sit very well. So again, I don't think any reason for concern for this compound. There doesn't seem to be any temporal shift and any true resistance. Flonicamid, um, we've also been screening with that, and again the baseline, and the data presented again with a 30 ppm screening dose. They're sitting quite nicely uh, up to 2012, and we also had a higher dose at 100 ppm, which sit nicely. 2012 sit nicely on top, and again 2013. So like 
with pymetrazine, I don't think any reason for concern, any reason that there's any selection going on favouring these types in the field, and hence this compound should work very well against this species. Another compound called spirotetramat, it's, uh, it's an acid derivative. Um, we've been screening with this as well. Um, these, these are very recent, relatively re recent data. Um, we did a little bit up to 2012 at 20 ppm, just a few samples sitting nicely. 2012 right at the top, so everything is being uh, affected. And 2013, again, no reason for concern. So again, this is good news, good news for these compounds. They, they should be working well in the field if they're being used. Also, I, I've been looking at something called cyanotranilipol. Now, this is a diamide. It's a new class of compounds that have been developed primarily by DuPont, sometime with some association with Syngenta. And they're highly systemic, so they could actually be used as seed treatments, but they're not actually registered for use in this country at the moment. But it, they, could, they could come through and maybe help us out, particularly if the neonicotinoids are being taken away from us. So the baseline, same set of data again, 30 ppm. No reason for concern for these either. So there's no, nothing within the population we think that's uh, pre-adapting uh, Mises persky to be resistant, and that compound should work well with a different mode of action to the others. So we do have alternatives potentially available. So to summarise... No overall upward trend in the NIC R, the near NIC resistant uh, or types in this country, and hence they, the near NICs should continue to work well when they're used at recommended rates, and also no evidence of resistance to those other compounds. What the work, I think, does illustrate, you need to continue monitoring. You can't rest on your laurels and you can't leave things. You need to have a contemporary picture of what's out there, and the best way is to use live aphids and live screening assays because they're basically challenging the aphids to, to the compounds and the aphids can't get away from that. And ultimately, the information is being used to update guidelines uh, to keep growers and agronomists informed of, of what, if there are any changes. It's jammed. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, sticking with the good... I've been doing some work looking at maybe handicaps that could be associated with insecticide resistance mechanisms. The can be target site in the nerve uh, proteins, and these are highly conserved. So if you stop introducing mutations that give resistance, it could actually mess up function and behavior of resistant individuals. So you can imagine, in the presence of insecticides, a, a mechanism that involves, obviously, gives a, a big advantage and outweighs any fitness drawback. However, if you take away that pressure, you can then have the drawbacks taking a fall, and that could he help you by reducing the frequency of re resistant uh, aphids, in this case, in the population. This is uh, amplified, I think, by whether aphids, resistant aphids, are stressed. You can imagine, in an environment which is very benign, they may not um, be outcompeted, or they may not do, do, uh, may, may do as well. However, if you stress them, in this case, in the, in, we think in this country, by a cold winter, you, you can actually um, impose those fitness costs. And I will say, a lot of people, when they find a new mechanism, they tend to look at the uh, implications of fitness costs in the laboratory under optimal conditions. And I think that's wrong. I think these individuals need to be stressed before you see any great difference in fitness. So one thing I've been doing is actually looking at the response of aphids to alarm pheromone. This is synthetic alarm pheromone, e beta-pharnazine. You drop it near the aphids, in this case a Mises persky clone, and you simply ask the question, what proportion of that clone move? And it turns out that those aphid clones, in this case, that carry resistance to OPs, which I know are being phased out, and pyrethroids, tend to move far less. They respond less. And we think that would have implications initially, we thought, we have implications for their ability to withstand attack by parasitoids and maybe, and maybe predators. Because alarm pheromone is thought to have evolved in the context of avoidance of, um, of, of being attacked. Because aphids that, 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 that sense it move away or drop off the leaf to get away. 
And we, as a consequence of this hypothesis, I did some work with parasitoids here, Diuretorella rapi, and I simply asked the question, were the more resistant clones more vulnerable to attack and ultimately to mummification? And we found that was the case. So aphids that carried KDR, which is a, a target site resistance to pyrethroids, and esterase and or esterase, high levels of esterase resistance, which gives us resistance to OPs, were more vulnerable and more likely to be mummified and then hence killed. So this, this stress is not only are beneficials good for, for, for helping you out with aphid control generally, it, it may well be that the resistant ones are attacked more. So this might be the scenario. Okay, very anthropomorphic this. We have an attacked aphid that's releasing the alarm pheromone. Aphids nearby, one that's susceptible to insecticides, one that's resistant. This one releases its own alarm pheromone, which is essentially a warning saying, let's get out of here. And this one goes, I don't sense anything. And that's why we think possibly that it's basically aphids behaving badly. They don't respond and they're attacked. Okay, the bad. Well, that's obviously resistance, isn't it? And uh, this is uh, essentially a, a section talking about what the latest is with Mises persicae. We've seen a decrease in the frequency of those with KDR over the uh, previous years. And this seemed to go against the grain in that pyrethroids were still being used. As a consequence of serendipity, which is great in science, you can't predict everything, I was doing some bioassays against clones that didn't have KDR, which I thought would be uh, uh, affected by pyrethroid uh, doses, and they weren't. So this sort of rang alarm bells. And I gave these aphids to a colleague of mine, Martin Williamson, and he essentially looked for other mutations to see if there were any there. And he, he didn't find the old, what we call the old super KDR, but we found something called a new super KDR. Essentially, it's a higher level of resistance than KDR. Um, so that had been knocking around the population um, prior to our knowledge. And again, it emphasizes that actually doing live bi bioassays is very important because you do challenge the aphids. It's all well and good discovering uh, a new mutation designing a DNA diagnostic so you can actually screen the population. However, that is often specific to a particular mutation, and you can miss other mutations. So the two should go hand in hand. You should do the DNA diagnostics and the live aphid bioassays. And it turns out that this super KDR mutation is found in what we call the O and P microsatellite genotypes, uh, which is uh, something basically DNA fingerprinting. We think that they're very common in the uh, UK population. So a, a slide here now showing uh, the frequency of samples that are in, in, from the field that have contained mace aphids. And you see there was a dip um, going up to 2,000. However, recently it's become very high to the extent that every sample we had in 2013 and 2012 contained mace aphids. Now these aphids are highly resistant to primocarb. So as part of the guidelines, primocarb is still not recommended for use against this species. And we can see we've started going back over the years looking for this new super KDR mechanism. And again, every sample contains super KDR aphids. So they are very, very common. And we would think would mean that pyrethroids shouldn't kill them. There is some, still some debate about whether pyrethroids cause repellency. And some growers, like potato growers, use them as a repellent. And we're hoping in the near future to get information on these super KDR aphids to see, although they're very happy in the presence, or they're not killed in the presence of pyrethroids, whether they are repelled. And if they're repelled, then that's a useful piece of information. It would mean that they would be pushed away from any treated uh, crop. And you can see here the presence of KDR in the last two years. We haven't seen any KDR aphids at all. Um, and just to uh, remind you about how this year has gone, it's... Um, it was a very late spring. In fact, it, I think it was the latest spring for 50 years. And we've also had a poor autumn migration. So Mises Persky this year has kept a fairly low profile. Um, a breakdown now of the resistance genotypes, uh, 2009, 2010, 11, and 12. And this is using the suction trap data headed by Richard Harrington at Rothamsted. So we have those that are susceptible for both MACE and KDR. 
those with MACE alone, those with KDR alone, and those with MACE and KDR. And you can see, up until recently, we, we thought that the population is mo majority consists of these MACE without KDR forms. However, as I've just mentioned, the population isn't really made up of that. We've got the super KDR. So if you actually look at this now, in 2013, when we started testing formally in the suction traps for super KDR, almost 94% of the aphids that are caught in the suction trap carry both mechanisms, so resistance to primocarb and resistance to pyrethroid. So if you actually take those data from before, what I think really was happening is this. You can substitute MACE and KDR for MACE with super KDR. So I think going back over the years, again, pyrethroid-resistant aphids have been present at very high frequencies. And if we... Next slide, please. Thank you. If you actually view the, what we think the UK population consists of, we think uh, aphids in this species don't have sex. Essentially, it's a case of no sex, please, we're British. And we're made of a population of clones where, which carry resistance mechanisms in combination, potentially, but they never near the twain shall meet. So if you can think of the O and P types as this type, over, at least over 90% of the population are O and P. But we need to continue monitoring to see if that continues. What I will say about O and P types, they've been around for several years, including through the very cold winter that we had a few years ago, where temperatures in some places went down to minus 20. So they seem particularly adapted to life in this country and cold winters. So they may well persist. And hence, the mechanism of MACE and super KDR that they carry will persist. OK. We have uh, a slide now showing the amount of time it's taken for different pests to evolve resistance to neonicotinoids. So it's first seen in tobacco whitefly, took about six years, glasshouse whitefly about six, Colorado potato beetle 11, brown plant hopper 10. And interestingly, up until recently, aphids have not cracked them. It was a neat trick, they haven't done it. But now, it was took, took 20 years of, of exposure to neonicotinoids. We do have resistance in Mises persky. When I say resistance, strong resistance. And in Aphis cassipii, the cotton melon aphid. Um, and what I've been calling these highly resistant aphids are Nick R++. So we're going up from the Nick R++. R++. And this is a map showing where we are finding them. And it's in um, peach and nectarine growing regions of southern Europe, northern Spain, southern France, and northern Italy. And this is a breakdown of, of the genotypes. This resistance is conferred by target sites. So you have a mutation in the target site. Aphids can either not have resistance, have one copy of the mutation, or have two. And those are the data that we found so far. Of course, what we think in the UK is that case. We've been looking for it, and we haven't found it. However, what's happening here, we need to look we need to find out, because aphids could be coming. I think the chances that we get resistant aphids were dependent on them coming from abroad. That's what normally happens. You have the mutation evolving, and then it spreads, the aphids spread, either under their own steam or on plant material. And this is a busy slide, I know, but essentially it's showing the resistance factors that we can have for these. So these are fully susceptible ones, what we consider. Those are heterozygotes and those are homozygotes. Interestingly, heterozygotes in the assay only have about 30-fold resistance, while the homozygotes, it's thousands. And again, this tells us if we do inherit these aphids, if they're heterozygotes, we can probably still do something about them. So it would be very important keeping an eye on the genotype of any aphids that may arrive in this country, because once the homozygotes arrive, we're in trouble. And up until recently, we thought, why aren't they moving? Why are they staying on peach and nectarines? However, recently in northern Italy, we, they've been found on other crops, eggplants and pepper. And I've done experiments in the lab where I transferred them onto other crops. And they do just as well. So all seed rape, for example, will, uh, they, will, they, will, they will rear on them and they will, uh, uh, they will spread to all seed rape. And the other bad news is that when we've looked at the pheromone response and parasite attack, they don't seem to be more vulnerable. They, they move just as well from alarm pheromone, and they, um, they're not vulnerable, differentially vulnerable to attack. So there doesn't seem to be that particular type of fitness cost in this mechanism. <clears throat> OK, I've got a few more minutes. We'll just move on to Cytobium mabini. You're probably aware of all the uh, problems it can cause that spread of BYDV. In 2011, there were reports of control failures with pyrethroids, so we inherited some of these uh, aphid samples. 
and my colleague looked at the DNA. We already knew, as I mentioned, KDR exists in, in, in other species, including Aphis cassipii and Mises persky. And what Mar Martin did was he looked for those mutations and he found a mutation which is the classic KDR. So that was the first time that we'd seen resistance in serial aphids um, uh, in this country, and in fact in Europe or, or the rest of the world. From that, Martin could de design a, a, a DNA diagnostic that allows us to distinguish between susceptibles, HETs, and HOMs. And in the meantime, I did some bioassays on these using a topical assay where basically you put aphids in a glass vial that's been treated with lambda cyhalothrin. <clears throat> we have a baseline uh, clone which we had from, um, in, in, the, in the lab at Rothamsted. We used that to give a baseline response which we allocate a resistance factor of one. And we too had two heterozygous clones. You can see the resistance factor is not huge. It's not like neonicotinoid resistance. It's thousands. It's in a region we would have expected for heterozygotes. So what about what's happening um, in, the, in the population in the field? Well, using the DNA diagnostic and aphids that are collected from suction traps, we actually, um, in 2012 and in 13 have been looking at different sites. And you can see here that... In every site, there are some of these heterozygous forms. Interestingly, we haven't seen a homozygote yet. Out of all the aphids that have been tested, if they carry resistance, it's in the heterozygous form. And also, dividing up into years, we can go back in time because of the suction trap work. You can see there was some concern going up to 2012 that things were just getting worse and worse, and they were becoming more and more frequent. This is what we've seen this year. And it's maybe stabilising. It's maybe not getting any greater. So that, that is good news. And again, I will stress in 2013, we have not seen any homozygotes. And the concern about homozygotes would be that they would carry higher resistance. And so, um, also, we've been looking at their diversity. And it appears that maybe the heterozygote clone is a clone or a, man, a, or a member of a few clones. And hence, we could potentially take that clone and see if it does have any drawbacks, any fitness costs, i.e. the diversity is very, is, very, is very limited. So possibly that mutation has just occurred in one aphid and then spread. Uh, and we've also found uh, these KDR aphids in Ireland and Germany. We had a few samples from the USA, but they didn't contain them. It doesn't mean to say it's not there, but we haven't seen it. So ultimately, uh, these data have been fed into updated guidelines which uh, appear on the IRAG website and, and on the HTCA website. So if you want to go to those just to see what the recommendations are. Essentially, they haven't changed since last year, which is we think pyrethroid should still work if they're applied at the right dose because heterozygotes shouldn't give very great resistance. It's when they're applied at reduced rates. And also there's a paper that's just about to come out in pest management science announcing that. And just to finish off, a few last slides, the ugly, which I struggled initially to think, well, how, what is the ugly? But actually I think the ugly is, as Claire mentioned, this restriction that's been imposed upon us, um, uh, which, will come into which has already come into force but will really affect all seed grape growers next year when the seed, neonic seed treatments will, will not be available. What alternatives will be available? Well... Pyrethroids and pyrimetrazine. Um, and this, this is how, how they can be applied. Um, however, as I've just said, with Mises persicae, if those O and P types persist, I don't think they're going to be controlled. It's, uh, be, uh, py, uh, unless py, and pyrimetrazine is fairly slow acting. Pyrethroids won't work against them. Unless there's some repellency, we'll have to see. And then ultimately, um, all seed rate growers might give up because there's another, there's another pest as well. And that pest is cabbage stem flea beetle. And you're probably aware that this year was a, a bad year for cabbage stem flea. Um, pyrethroids saying they're not working. Uh, the growers saying that pyrethroids are not working. We've been allocated some money by HTCA to look into that because um, we know now that cabbage stem flea beetle has pyrethroid resistance in Germany. It's evolved in that country. So we need to see what the situation is in the UK. And I'm hoping in, uh, next year to do that. I was hoping to get some samples this year, but the, uh, there's a clue in the, in the name. They jump and they're very hard to catch. And we're going to get them in the harvest next year and test them with a bioassay similar to cytobin, but also look at their DNA and see if there's any evidence for mutations. And just to finish off, um, this restriction could well extend to other compounds. 
at the moment, Neonix, uh, the restriction is for two years, but possibly it could be extended, and also it could move on to other, other uh, actives. So it's a worrying time, because as you know, the, the key to resistance management, these are the, the neonicotinoids, uh, IRAC mode of action, is variation. It's the, essentially, variation uh, is the spice of, of resistance management. Um, these are some publications that have come out via uh, HTCA, which are connected with the work being done at Rothamsted, and you can again get those on the um, HTCA site. And it just remains for me to say thank you to these people, the supporters including uh, HTCA. Thank you very much. <laughs>